Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Living Room Lecture Series with Historic Locust Grove. My name is Hannah Zimmerman, and I am the Marketing and Communications Director at Historic Locust Grove. And we are so pleased you're with us today for uh, a talk with Dan Gediman of The Reckoning Radio. Um, we'll introduce Dan in just a few moments. We do have a few quick announcements. I'll ask everyone to keep their microphones and videos turned off for the duration of the program. Um, and um, we are also going to be asking questions in the chat. The chat box is, you can find it right below my face. There's a little, um, you hover over it, there's a little box marked chat. Um, and you uh, should be able to click that. We're, we'd love to find out how you found out about this program. Um, and also, um, if you've listened to The Reckoning Radio, either on radio or in podcast form. Um, and for now, I'm going to turn it over to Locust Grove's Executive Director, Dr. Carol Ely, um, to say a few words about what's going on at Locust Grove. Hello, Carol. Hi. Hi. Hello. Good to see you all. It's a very distinguished audience today. And I think we've been trying to get Dan to speak for over a year now. So I'm so glad that uh, he was uh, able to be with us today. I'm looking forward to the presentation. Um, as many of you know, at the moment, Locust Grove is closed to the public. We close every winter for our annual maintenance and planning. And uh, we are doing that for an additional month through February. We're still looking at March and when it might be safe to reopen and in what way. Chances are you'll see a gradual rollout of our programs with things that happen outdoors happening first. Uh, we can resume grounds tours. We can have aspects of our event like gardeners Fair that happen outdoors and uh, include some special tours, continue to do online tours. And we hope that as the spring and summer continue, we will be able to do more and more of not only the things that you're used to, but some new things that you uh, may not have experienced yet at Locust Grove. And the one good thing about this pandemic, if we can put, it's probably maybe two good things, but one is that it's a pause on everything. It's a chance to really rethink what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and who for. And we really have embraced this opportunity. Uh, one of the things that we, of course, deal with is the reckoning with the legacy of slavery in this place. And we have spent the last year pushing forward initiatives, most of which had begun before the pandemic, but this gave us the opportunity to really focus. We've uh, started a long time ago incorporating the story of the enslaved people of Locust Grove into all of our programs. But what we are doing now is a kind of recentering of our whole narrative to try to bring their story to the forefront and to emphasize that narrative. And that has included um, additional research, which gives us deeper and better stories to tell. It uh, incorporates uh, meeting some of the descendants. We're, we're pleased that we've been able to locate a few people whose family history puts them right in this place. We have been working on partnerships, including the partnership we've been developing for a long time with the University of Louisville, particularly the African American Theater Program. We've been working with Louisville Tourism as a partner in a collection of experiences called uh, Unfiltered to look at slavery and the legacy of slavery in this region. And we're uh, hoping to debut pandemic allowing um, our experience, which is called Unfolding the Story and focuses on the enslaved laundress and enslaved distillery uh, workers at Locust Grove. So we're very excited about that. We're working on internships. We are creating, just talked about it earlier this week, a garden plot that will be behind the reconstruction of an enslaved person's house that we are creating in what was the woodshop building at Locust Grove. So that's really going to be the centerpiece of the new experience uh, once again, once the pandemic allows us to be in an interior space together. 
Um, and it will be a recreated slave dwelling as a place to uh, honor and discuss and learn about the lives of the people who are enslaved, not just in terms of their labor and their suffering, but in terms of their culture and their families and their hopes and dreams. And we want to try to make them as real as individuals as we can, because what slavery did was strip people of their individuality and their humanity and their, their family stories. So another challenge for us now is to really learn how to discuss not just the period of enslavement when the Krons uh, were here at Locust Grove, but the legacy that that has created uh, on this site in Louisville, in our country, how to effectively discuss that. And that's why we're uh, making sure that we're listening to the conversations that are going on around this. And that's why it's so great to have Dan's fine work in this area. And I like you and here to listen to what Dan has to say. So thank you. Back to Hannah. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, so just once again, we're gonna ask everyone to keep their microphone and video turned off for the duration of the program. Um, in the chat, please let us know uh, if you have listened to The Reckoning, and also please let us know any questions you have. I will be monitoring the chat uh, for uh, Dan, and then I will be asking your questions on your behalf at the end of the program. Um, all that being said, Dan, are you ready to be introduced? Yes, I am. That's all right, right. And, here and just we before go. I start, would you sure. refresh me when we're gonna transition to the Q&A, just so I can watch the clock? Yeah, we will transition to the Q&A at two o'clock or when you finish speaking, whichever okay. comes first. <laughs> All, All right. right. Um, okay, Dan Gettyman, ladies and gentlemen, is a longtime public radio producer whose work has been heard on All Things Considered, Morning Edition, Marketplace, Jazz Profiles, and This American Life. During his long radio career, he has won many of public broadcasting's most prestigious awards, including the DuPont Columbia Award. Dan is the executive director of This I Believe Incorporated, a nonprofit organization based in Louisville that produces the popular podcast series, The Same Name, as well as the Webby award-winning website, thisibelieve.org. He has co-edited nine This I Believe books, including the New York Times bestseller, This I Believe, The Personal Philosophies of Remarkable Men and Women. Most recently, Dan produced the Audible documentary series, The Homefront, Life in America During World War II, which is narrated by Martin Sheen and was nominated for two Audi Awards. In addition, Dan is producing a new documentary series, The Reckoning, Facing the Legacy of Slavery in America, which is currently being distributed as both a broadcast and podcast series and is the reason we are here today. Dan Gediman, welcome to the Living Room Lecture Series. Please take it away. All right, thank you so much, Hannah, and thank you, Carol, for your kind words before. Um, so I uh, am going to assume that most of the people on this call have some familiarity with what the reckoning is, but since I know this is being recorded and archived and will also appear as a, a YouTube video, I'm going to sort of um, give you some basic background on this project. Uh, so first of all, I'm Dan Gediman. I'm the executive director of the nonprofit organization Reckoning Inc. That's the hat I'm wearing today, uh, which is set up to oversee the Reckoning Public Media Project. And as Hannah indicated, it is predominantly built around a public radio series uh, and a podcast series. Um, the public radio series, by the way, is continuing. There is a final episode. It was always intended to be a set of four hour long specials. And the final hour is gonna be airing nationally in the month of February. We're just putting the finishing touches on it this week. Uh, I got an email from the program director at uh, WFPL that sh she will be airing this final episode during the month of February. And it is airing on, on public radio stations around the country. In addition to that four part, four hour long series, uh, we have a continuing podcast series by the same name. And eventually in the chat, Hannah's gonna put information on how you can subscribe to that. And I would highly encourage 
be subscribing to it since we put a lot of work into it and um, think there's some useful information in there. Anyway, so what I'm here to talk to you about is sort of the origins of this project, um, the research that's gone into it, what it has to tell us in particular about the experience of slavery in Kentucky and how that translates to the experience of slavery throughout the United States. Um, and I, I, I wanna stress that while the first phase of this project, uh, thus, which has aired thus far, is squarely focused on Kentucky. We are rather quickly moving away from just talking about Kentucky. As a matter of fact, this final episode of the broadcast series, um, although it touches on Kentucky, it is predominantly featuring uh, various scholars from around the country. And they're talking about the, not just the phenomenon of slavery, but how it affects, how the legacy of slavery affects us today in terms of health, wealth, and issues of uh, racial violence. So, um, and I'll tell you more about that as we, as we progress. So I'm gonna switch and share screen here with you uh, for a presentation that I have put together, which will take a split second to load, I think. Yes, okay. All right, so, um, this is the title of our project and of the radio series. Uh, it's kind of self-explanatory what I just mentioned. So I'm gonna walk you through some information about um, slavery in Kentucky. And this project is the first thing I've done in my career. I've been in public radio for, for a very long time since the early eighties. And I've lived in Kentucky in Louisville since 1984. However, I've not ever done anything before professionally about Kentucky, anything to do with Kentucky's history. Um, as uh, Hannah mentioned, I, I did a radio series um, for Audible a couple of years ago that was all about the experience of America during World War II. And what I have what I came to understand is in order to understand, we did a whole uh, episode about the African-American experience during World War II, um, which was not a very good experience. And so in order to understand how that came about, I had to work backwards and learn about uh, how African-Americans were treated during World War I and to understand the, uh, the, the bloody period of 1919, 1920, and all of the race, so-called race riots that happened in America during that time. And then in order to understand that, I started looking at the reconstruction period in the late 19th century, the period of Jim Crow. And in order to understand that, I had, I had to understand what happened during the Civil War. In order to understand that, I had to understand the antebellum period. And I had never studied this part of American history hardly at all. It had been skated over in all the history classes I ever took. And that is, by the way, one of the reasons for this project is I believe that we, all of us, almost without exception, have been poorly educated. Unless you have gone out of your way to become a scholar, uh, kind of an autodidactical scholar of this part of American history, what you were taught in school was probably largely wrong or let, let's put it this way, a very incomplete version of the truth. And the, the main purpose of this project is to correct the incorrect information that has appeared in a lot of textbooks and curricula over the past really 100 plus years. Um, there's an episode in our radio series and podcast series that just focuses on the I don't know what else to call it other than a conspiracy on the part of the daughters of the American of the Confederacy to um, create a new set of textbooks and place them in the hands of educators around the country. And I should say parenthetically that um, the daughters of the American uh, the daughters of the Confederacy chapter in Louisville was at the forefront of that effort. I'm jumping way ahead in the story, except to explain why it is that we've been so badly educated. Um, so just to finish that story, the, da the Daughters of the uh, Confederacy uh, paid for, published, and distributed for free crates of books that were new, new histories of the United States with a very specific emphasis on um, 
sort of the positive nature of slavery, its connection to natural law, sort of the, 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 uh, the, what came to be known as the lost cause narrative of American history. So we're gonna talk about that more later, but I just wanted to mention that this is sort of the why we are so badly educated about our own history. And my experience as a, as a transplanted Northerner, I grew up in, in the Boston area in Kentucky, is that Kentucky had a, has, a particularly, has been particularly badly educated about its own history. Um, and um, so to that end, I'm gonna give you some information, some good information. So first of all, um, there are a whole bunch of myths about Kentucky and slavery. And one of the myths is that slavery in Kentucky was a very uh, small part of, of Kentucky culture and Kentucky's economy, that it, uh, that it was fairly insignificant, that we had very little, very few slaves. Um, we never had very many, meaning any individual uh, agricultural operation might only have a handful. They were very well treated. It's, it's, we've always compared ourselves to the Deep South over and over and over again. And even in the antebellum period, if you read letters from this period, you read editorials in the newspapers, et cetera, you will over and over again hear people saying or read people saying, um, thank goodness we treat our, quote, servants well here in Kentucky, not like those so-and-sos from Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. Now, although the total number of enslaved people was relatively low compared to the other the states of the Deep South, the percentage of people in Kentucky that owned at least a enslaved person was very high. Um, so uh, according to the 1850 census, 28% of all families owned at least one enslaved person. Um, even uh, more significant is how many people, even if they didn't own someone, leased them. Um, according to some of the scholarship of Blaine Hudson, the late Blaine Hudson from U of L, uh, perhaps as many as 50% of all the enslaved people in Kentucky at any given moment during the, the 1850 to 1865 period were leased, meaning they were working outside of the, uh, the family that had originally enslaved them. And so they might be working at a factory, they might be working at a, some other farm, they might be working um, as a skilled, you know, uh, you know carpenter, a, a, a mason, something like that. Or they might be working as a seamstress, they might be working as a domestic. Uh, lots of people in Louisville in particular uh, leased slaves as domestics, even though they might not own any. So the average number of, 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 of enslaved people owned by any given family was five. And only five people in Kentucky had more than 100 enslaved people. Uh, one of the largest slaveholders in Jefferson County was William Christian Bullitt. Our series, The Reckoning, is um, focused to a large degree on the Bullitt family, uh, which uh, owned and still owns the Oxmore um, farm. And uh, so there's a lot of focus on, on the Bullitt family, mainly because they left behind quite a paper trail in terms of letters and um, various other kinds of ephemera. They were really uh, pack rats and held on to a lot of that stuff and it has survived to this day and is in the Filson's um, possession. And they've done a marvelous job of, uh, of archiving it and, and collating it and indexing it. So if you owned an enslaved person, there were multiple ways you could make money from them the direct labor of those people, leasing them, which we talked about. Um, and leasing, I say in the radio series, was almost like printing money because if you leased someone, uh, it was usually on an annual basis. You would do a contract for a year at a time and it would stipulate in the contract that the leasee would pay for all the expenses of that person. So they would pay for their room, their board, uh, their clothing, medical care, Etc. And in some cases, they even baked into the contract insurance that the person doing the leasing would have to insure that person in case of injury or death. So 100% of the expenses are covered by the person leasing 
uh, the enslaved person, but the owner is getting all the money. And of course the enslaved person is getting nothing. Um, and then the third way that people made money was to borrow against the value of their enslaved people uh, to purchase more land, more slaves, or to invest in a business. And we see evidence of this all over the place in Kentucky and throughout the, uh, the states that had slavery. And by the way, slavery was all over the North uh, up until the late 19th, early 20th, uh, sorry, the late 18th, early 19th century. And so if you go back into the records in New York and Massachusetts and you know, other Northern states, you will find evidence of all these things as well. And as I say here, because enslaved people reproduced, uh, their assets would increase exponentially as a result. And I will show you that in a moment, how that would work. So, sorry. So here's an example, and this is taken from a paper that was published by uh, Blaine Hudson. He looked at this one in particular person that exemplified how you could go from penniless to the landed gentry in a relatively short period of time because of the way you um, utilized enslaved people. So this guy, Enos Hardin, was an illiterate, um, basically from all indicators, penniless uh, young farmer. He moves to Owen County. We don't know where he was originally born. And in the 1819 uh, tax rolls, he has a total estate valued at $100. However, he has a couple of slaves. And over the course of the next decades, you will see how he is able to parlay these enslaved people into first land, right? Then livestock, okay? And then, he's, and then the, the enslaved people start to reproduce, uh, presumably, that's why some of these numbers are going up, but also he may have been purchasing more, okay? And their value keeps going up because the value of enslaved people grew exponentially between 1900 and, sorry, 1800 and 1860, just about tripled in value. So if you, if you purchased an enslaved person in 1800 and they lived until 1860, their value might have just about tripled. And imagine if you will, that you have you know, five or more people on your farm, then all of that value increases as well. So by the time he reaches 1858, he has an estate valued uh, at just shy of $13,000. I forget what that, at, what that would be in today's um, economy, but I'm gonna guess it's at least a couple of hundred thousand dollars. So he becomes, by the time he dies, one of the 10 wealthiest people in Owen County. So this shows you just kind of the way that somebody could make money. Now. This is an example, I'm gonna whiz through some of these things of how people used enslaved people, how slaveholders used their enslaved as collateral for loans, okay? And back then you could get loans, not just from a bank, but from another person. So you could do an, a contract just with a neighbor or somebody from across town. And uh, you know, th there were people who just did this, who put money out on the street, so to speak, as almost like loan sharks, you know, private loan sharks. And they would, people would use their enslaved as collateral. So let's say you want to, again, raise money to buy a piece of land or improve your land or buy livestock or whatever, you put up your enslaved people as collateral, okay? So then here's an example of someone who's getting money from the bank, okay? And you don't need to be able to read all this. I will just let you know, it, it has a list of human beings' names that are being put up it's at the bottom if you see the following slaves uh, and it lists their names, Diana, Katie, Mary, William, uh, Linton, Harriet, Emily, etc., are being put up as collateral for a large bank loan. Okay, and this, was, this happens to be from Louisiana, but this most definitely uh, was done in Kentucky as well. I just happened to have gotten this from, um, from Louisiana. So then this is how uh, this would work is banks would combine all of these mortgages into a single bond in the exact same way that people's mortgages for their houses today are combined into securities, uh, which is a lot of what got us into the hot water of the 2008-2009 uh, housing crash. 
um, that people had all of these derivatives and stuff based on bad mortgages. So this is an example of how you could, even if, just think about this for a second, even if you didn't own an enslaved person, maybe you lived in the North, maybe you lived in Europe, maybe you lived in anywhere really on the globe and you had some money to spend, you could put it into essentially slavery bonds in the United States. And people did this. As I understand it, um, the, the, a lot of the crown wealth of Europe was invested in uh, these slave mortgages and certainly all sorts of wealthy financiers in Europe were, were invested and certainly Northern financiers as well. So slave leasing, a very lucrative thing. I already mentioned this. This just happens to be a, a contract uh, that William Christian Bullitt went into with a guy who was a neighbor of his in Henderson County. And he's listing the people that this uh, soper, his neighbor, is going to um, use as farmhands for the year. And he lists what their value is. You know, most of them are getting $180 a year. A couple of them are younger or women and they get less money. And it's going to add up to $1,160 a year. And this, again, I don't have on the top of my head what that would be in today's money, but it's a lot of money. And again, he has no outlay in terms of overhead for these people that all of the, uh, it, it, it specifies that, you know, all of their uh, needs are going to be met by Mr. Soper. So if you're going to lease a slave, then you want to uh, insure slaves. And so there are, uh, you can find these online. This is exactly the, my entryway into this entire project was that I found a list of uh, insurance policies that were taken out on enslaved people throughout the country. Okay, and there happened to be an article in the New York Times about this phenomenon. And in this article, it mentioned for some reason, a guy in, in Louisville and how he was insuring, I forget how many, 10 or so of his enslaved people. And his name was Stephen Chenoweth. And that got me wondering, who is this guy? And then I started to do a whole bunch of research about him and I'll tell you more about him shortly. But it was because he took out insurance. He had um, leased out several of his enslaved men to work on river boats on the Ohio River. And it was a very dangerous thing. River um, steam engines on river boats were very um, prone to explosion. People were being burned. Um, there was all sorts of ways you could get harm if you were working on a steamboat uh, or on a train for that matter. And so this was a common thing. So this is taken, this is an ad in a Louisville newspaper, uh, how you can go about get, taking out insurance uh, on your slaves. So this is just a, a, a graphic way of explaining how much money of the Kentucky economy was held in the bodies of enslaved people, okay? So between 1846 and 1860, the number goes from roughly 150, sorry, sorry, um, one and a half million to over, a little over three million, okay? And um, sorry, I take that back, a uh, billion. Billion, not million, but billion. Is that right? Hold on, am I doing my numbers right? Let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's a lot of money uh, of the economy of Kentucky. So as the prices rise, I already mentioned that the prices tripled over the course of the, the first half of the, 20, of the 19th century. More and more people are going into the business of buying and selling slaves. Um, and what's interesting about it, as I looked into it, is that these were not just um, dedicated slave traders, although we certainly had people who were dedicated slave traders, like these two guys, the Arterburn brothers, who were uh, notorious local um, slave traders. Uh, but also, it was so lucrative that people would do it as a side business. So for instance, you might be in real estate you might be in dry goods, you might be have a grocery store, you might sell furniture, you might sell uh, cattle, you know, other kinds of um, livestock, you might be in any number of livelihoods. And on the side, you sell some slaves, or you lease some slaves, or you do both. Okay, there were some people who were um, got involved with bu buying, selling and leasing 
slaves. And sometimes it would be the same deal. It would be almost like um, um, where you can lease a car with an option to buy it later on. So there were all sorts of ways that you could, as you build up your nest egg and you had money to invest, you could essentially, you know, buy out your 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 loan and actually purchase the, the person in question. So um, a lot of people started doing this on the side. So Kentucky becomes one of the biggest exporters of slaves in America. So the cotton boom, which basically encompasses the first half of the 19th century, triggers this huge demand for enslaved labor. As I already mentioned, the, the, the prices just about triple. And Kentucky becomes the second largest exporters of enslaved people in the country after Virginia. And as I say, more and more people go into the business. Louisville is particularly well suited to this business because of its river port, okay? So um, all sorts of slave traders are bringing people overland to Louisville from the, from the inner part of Kentucky or maybe even up from Northern Tennessee or over from West Virginia or you know, anywhere in the general area, bring them across the land to Louisville, put them on uh, first flatboats and then steamships to go down the Ohio, to go down to the Mississippi and eventually end up at the um, slave markets in either Natchez, Mississippi or New Orleans. They were the two biggest hubs, uh, the two biggest markets. One of the, the top three slave traders in the United States lived in Louisville, his name was Rice Ballard. Um, it's the same Ballard family, Ballard High School, uh, Ballard County, et cetera. Um, and uh, there's a book that I don't know if it's already published or if it's just about to be published, but it's written by a guy that I interviewed for the series. And it is all about this, uh, these, top, these three men who were in partnership with, when it, with each other who became sort of like the, uh, how can I describe it? The general motors of slave trading in America. They just sort of industrialized it. And uh, Rice Ballard was their man in the middle of the country. And the other two partners were based in Alexandria, Virginia. And so uh, Ballard took care of sort of the middle of the country and the river traffic um, to get slaves down to the Natchez and, and, uh, and, and uh, New Orleans markets. And then his partners in Alexandria took all of the slaves that were coming from Maryland and Virginia in particular, or maybe from the Carolinas, and they would go to the sea ports and they would go in specially outfitted boats that the company owned, the partnership owned, and take them down around uh, Florida to the Gulf Coast and to the port of New Orleans. And uh, this guy lived on, on Broadway and um, was, when he died, one of the wealthiest men in, in the United States. And I bet uh, you've never heard of him. So, um, and by the way, one of the reasons we know so much about this partnership is because he left behind, like the Bullitt family, a huge cache of papers. And eventually those ended up at, um, I think it's, it's either Duke University or UNC. UNC, I think, has them in, in their archives and a lot of them are um, available online to look at. So I already started to mention this guy, Stephen Chenoweth. So this is the same family as Chenoweth Lane, Chenoweth School. Um, Stephen Chenoweth was the jailer for Jefferson County. And I should say parenthetically that until 1850, if you were a county uh, official in Kentucky, you were sort of like, um, a combination uh, appointed official and entrepreneur. You basically got paid through fees that you levied against or with the people you were doing business with. So for instance, the sheriff would get paid by various fees that he was collecting. The, the tax collector would get a percentage of the taxes they were collecting. Judges would get paid essentially by the people appearing before them. And in the case of the jailer, he gets paid every time somebody's in his jail, okay? And back then, uh, at least this kind of jail that he was running was more than anything else, a place where you put enslaved people who were awaiting the next phase of their lives. So maybe their owners had died and uh, they're part of an estate that's being liquidated by the, um, the family of the, of the deceased. 
maybe there was a bankruptcy and uh, the enslaved people were collateral, or not collateral, they were part of the estate of the, of the, the bankrupt uh, business. And one way or the other, these enslaved people are gonna be sold by the courts um, or by the sheriff. And um, they have to be somewhere in the interim. And so the jail becomes the way station for these enslaved people. Also, if somebody has been um, labeled a runaway slave, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, they would be put in the jail for a, a, a statutory period of time, six months. And uh, if nobody claimed them, then they would be sold at auction. And either way, somebody pays the jailer for the amount of time that that person is in his jail. And uh, he uh, was involved with uh, a jail that essentially was his own fiefdom, uh, not far from where the existing jail is at Sixth and Jefferson, but it was actually closer to Fifth uh, and Jefferson, I believe. And in his spare time, he moonlights as a slave trader. And if you think about it, it's a perfect combination because all these enslaved people are ending up in your jail and he gets to sort of pick and choose the most valuable people in his charge. And then he essentially double deals. He, he sells himself these enslaved people. And then he has partners who sell them and take them down the river to the Natchez um, slave market. So slave traders regularly, especially after the uh, Fugitive Slave Act is passed in 1850, are regularly selling uh, enslaved people that are either stolen, sort of like a, a horse thief, you know, people who were, people were going in the middle of the night and basically grabbing enslaved people from their slave cabins, um, gagging them, putting them on a horse or throwing them in the back of a wagon and then taking them to Louisville quickly putting them on a riverboat and sending them down to, to Natchez or New Orleans. This guy, Stephen Chenoweth, uh, it's documented in various court cases, he did this. Or let me put it this way, his associates working for him did this. Also, it was a regular thing to send uh, parties across the river to Indiana and Ohio and as far away as you know, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and steal free people of color and send them back into slavery. So, you know, famously the, the movie 12 Years a Slave tells the story of Solomon Northup, and that was his story exactly. Well, this is an example of a court case where um, such a person was um, stolen and sold and ends up down in Louisiana. And it's this guy, Stephen Chenoweth, who is uh, in the middle of it. So this is a particularly ugly part of Kentucky's slavery story. Um, Lexington was a hub for a very specific unsavory part of the slave trade. And that is there were slave traders, one in particular based in, in Lexington that specialized in young women, sometimes teenagers or even younger. And um, an Illinois Senator was in Lexington for the races and he visits one of these establishments in 1854 and he leaves this description in his diary, okay? And basically it's, um, I, don't, it, it, I don't even know what to, how to describe it. It's almost like going to a pet store, right? Where there's, there's different women in different rooms and you walk from room to room and you, you can ask them to turn around or, you, know, you can talk to them and then you decide who you wanna buy and take home with you. And in particular, this guy would set up shop and start advertising around when the races were happening in the spring. And it catered to quote sporting men, a lot of them from, from uh, New Orleans who would come up to Lexington for uh, the month that all the races were happening in the spring and maybe buy some horses, maybe buy some women and take them back to where they came from. So this woman, that he's talking about was being sold for what for, in today's currency would be $50,000. So this was an extremely lucrative business. Um, so this is an important part of the story that um, we haven't yet had time to go into in the radio or podcast series, but we're going to. Um, Kentucky had a thriving anti-slavery movement. 
Now I'm calling it specifically an anti-slavery movement rather than an abolitionist movement because, and this is one of those things that I never knew until I worked on this project. And that is that um, true abolitionists were a re rel relatively small part of the continuum of people who were against slavery in this country and specifically in Kentucky. There was a, a rather wide spectrum of people who thought slavery was a bad idea. They may have thought it was a bad idea for economic reasons. They may have thought it was a bad idea for political reasons. They may have thought it was a bad idea for moral reasons, for religious reasons, all different reasons. Um, and, and Kentucky became a, uh, a really interesting kind of test case for all these different competing ideas for what to do about slavery. Everybody thought in the 1840s, especially uh, around the country, there seemed to almost be a consensus, even in the South, certainly in Kentucky, that something different should happen with slavery. But nobody could quite get a handle on what that different thing was. But one of the most um, popular ideas that was being talked about in Kentucky was the idea of gradual emancipation with resettlement in Africa, specifically in Liberia. And as a matter of fact, there is, to this day, it is my understanding, a part of Liberia um, that was basically funded and purchased by Kentuckians. And um, it was sort of the brainchild of first Henry Clay, uh, and then other people, including uh, our William Christian Bullitt, who eventually becomes the, the, uh, the president of the Louisville chapter of the, um, the, uh, this resettlement um, uh, association. I'm forgetting their, their, their title, the name of the, uh, the organization, but uh, it's, it, it's this colonization effort. So the big idea was you slowly emancipate enslaved people um, maybe, at, you know, sometimes it was 21 or 25, or maybe um, later in time or at a particular moment in, in, in historical time, like, you know, starting in 1870 or something, then slaves would be, would be freed. The owners would get money and there were different schemes for how they would get paid, whether it was uh, through taxes or whether it was through legislation. Uh, but one way or another, they would be compensated. So this all leads up to a watershed moment in Kentucky's history, which is in 1849. The anti-slavery advocates called for a constitutional convention. They tried to do this for several years in a row and they finally got it happening in 1849. And during this, the run up to this convention, um, it got bloody. There were people who were killed, um, uh, who there were all sorts of shenanigans to keep anti-slavery delegates from getting elected to serve in this uh, constitutional convention. And when the smoke cleared, most of the people who served in this convention were wealthy slaveholders, even those who were quote, anti-slavery people. And, in, and, and the goal of this convention really was to change the, the, the constitution of Kentucky to abolish slavery, or at least to have some gradual emancipation plan. But instead, the pro-slavery lobby, led among others by William Christian Bullitt from, from Oxmoor, uh, put the kibosh on that. And the Constitutional Convention, instead of abolishing slavery, they protect it. And Kentucky ends up with the most pro-slavery constitution uh, of any of the states of the country. So it's a, a moment of Kentucky's history that I believe everybody should know about, including all students. Uh, time is fleeting and I'm talking way too much. So I'm gonna compress a bunch of stuff in the next several uh, minutes. Um, so something I should mention is that uh, city and, and county governments and state government were all making money off of slavery from various kinds of, of, of taxes. Uh, I won't bother going into all the details um, on this, but it was basically, it turned into a property, a property valuation scheme, which is how we continue to do it today. That's why we have a property valuation administrator. And each one of you who is a homeowner gets a, you know, uh, gets a, a, a tax bill that's based on the value of your property. Well, they did the same thing, but with enslaved people. And there was, you know, sort of uh, some sort of system of taxation based on the age 
and gender of the enslaved person in terms of what they were valued at. And then you were, you were charged a tax. Uh, and I should mention that this, um, this uh, taxation system puts the burden of almost all of Kentucky's taxes on the slaveholders. So that means if you are a poor non-slaveholding laborer, let's say, or even a, a poor farmer that has no enslaved people, maybe you're even leasing your land, you have, you're paying virtually no taxes. So you can think of it as a progressive tax system. And so part of the logic when they were trying to convince the electorate, the white male electorate to support this pro-slavery constitution was to say, you know what, uh, keep this situation as we have it and you won't have to pay any taxes because we'll take care of paying all the taxes. We wealthy slave owners will pay the, the state's taxes, okay? And you can see after the 1850 uh, convention when they changed this whole system, how uh, the amount of money that's coming into the state's coffers skyrockets based on uh, property valuation based slave taxes. So it becomes roughly 20% of all of the uh, tax revenue for the state of Kentucky for, for the decade between 1850 and 1860. Okay, and because of this, okay, and I'm gonna jump ahead here. Um, well, gosh. Uh, well, well, we'll get to it in a second. Um, so there's other ways that cities and counties made money. I already mentioned that they were auctioning off uh, enslaved people and they made money from that. They would get a per percentage of all of those. They also got money for housing uh, people. These are notices of actual slave sales that were happening uh, either conducted by Jefferson County or by Louisville. Okay. So here's just a quick summary of some of the numbers of how specifically Jefferson County was tied to slavery. According to the 1860 census, there were roughly 10,000 enslaved people in Jefferson County. The average value uh, per enslaved person was roughly $1,800 or 55,000 today. So if you add that all up, uh, roughly $550 million worth of wealth tied up in enslaved people in 1860 just in Jefferson County. So let that sink in for a second. Think about today, if there was $550 million worth of wealth tied up in anything in Jefferson County, it would be something that we would not sneeze at. We would not wanna lose that. So let's say, imagine if you will, I don't know, we were making $550 million from um, the airport Okay, and all the various businesses surrounding the airport. And all of a sudden, they decided to close the airport. And instead, all the flights were be gonna be routed to Cincinnati or Lexington, and we weren't gonna have an airport anymore. I think people would be raising bloody heck over that. And that's basically the situation that Kentucky was in, Louisville was in circa 1860, as the Civil War is starting to uh, build up steam. So here is something that I stumbled on in an editorial in the Louisville Courier that sums up just how cognizant people in Louisville and in, in Kentucky were of slavery and the Civil War as an economic crisis, not anything else but economic and specifically tied to uh, slavery. So in this editorial, it says, and I'm gonna read it, there are 250,000 slaves in Kentucky worth more than $100 million. In those, in those days, that's $100 million, 1861. To emancipate these Negroes would be to destroy at one blow more than one fifth of the taxable property of the state. It would cut off one fifth of the total revenue. Additional taxes would have to be imposed on land, houses, and personal property. Some of the best and most loyal citizens of the Commonwealth would be reduced from affluence and luxury to ruin and beggary. By the way, this is written in, in, in December, 1861, right after the start of the Civil War. And at this moment in time, the, the Louisville Courier, which was the pro-slavery, pro-Confederate uh, daily newspaper has moved out of Kentucky because uh, basically they're treasonous, uh, they're, they're pro-Confederate and they had to move their operation. I think at this moment in time, they were in Nashville, if I remember correctly. Okay. So um, I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation um, that some of what, rec what the reckoning is about. 
Um, so we're all about education. First and foremost, sort of public education, using the airwaves, using podcasts, using our website, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, reckoningradio.org, to educate the public, not just um, uh, adults, but children, uh, and you know, of all ages, all students of all ages, on the true history of slavery in this country. And in particular, we, because we're based in Kentucky, we have a particular interest on improving the status quo for uh, schools in Kentucky. So to that end, we have um, gotten uh, grant money and uh, hired curriculum consultants and put together a series of curricula for elementary, middle and high school uh, students that is in particular set up to meet the social studies um, uh, criteria for the, the state of Kentucky. So, so it, it's kind of specifically follows mandates in Kentucky, but also is basically stuff that could be used by any educator in the country for elementary, middle and high school interested in, in doing a better job of teaching their students about the true history of slavery and the importance of, the, of, of slavery as the driver of what happened in the Civil War, which is another part of the story that we tell in The Reckoning. One of the things that was so important in my research was um, I set out to, to find every available written narrative that exists of a formerly enslaved Kentuckian. And um, they are spread out all over the place because there was this diaspora of enslaved Kentuckians because of the slave trade. So there were all these people who were born and raised as enslaved people in Kentucky who at some point in their lives were then sold to and sent down the river famously to you know, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. And then if they survived the Civil War were then um, emancipated and might have settled in any number of other states. A lot of them moved up north. So they might've ended up in Cleveland or in Cincinnati or in Indianapolis or any number of places. And so in the 1930s, when the Federal Writers Project started to send people out to interview formerly enslaved people, there were people who were from Kentucky who were living all over the place. So I basically had to go through all of the available enslaved uh, narratives across the board and check them carefully. I did a lot of, uh, you know, um, word searching to find anything to do with Kentucky. The word Kentucky, I, I looked for counties, I looked for city names, etc. And I found about 115 of these that um, were from people from Kentucky. We put them all together on our website. We have a searchable database. You can look, um, it's sliced and diced in all sorts of ways. You can look for, you know, enslaved people from a particular county or a particular uh, city or who had particular kinds of experiences. So the, the curricula that these uh, curriculum development people built for us um, points to these oral histories. So that instead of learning this history through the eyes of, uh, in many cases, very flawed or, or racist or, or severely misguided historians from the, from the 20th century, especially, um, you're actually getting it from the the mouths, if you will, of enslaved people. And those, I will say just as a caveat, the WPA uh, slave narratives from the 1930s are very problematic for a whole bunch of reasons because but mostly it was white people taking down the what they heard these people saying and basically do it, taking dictation. Um, and then sometimes they, they put their story in, in the white person's words. So we, we mention all this on our website that, you know, take these with a slight grain of salt, realize they are not verbatim transcripts in many cases. Um, also, we put together a detailed bibliography, both about slavery specifically in Kentucky and slavery nationally. There's transcripts of all of our radio programs. We've created bibliographies for every episode of the series. We have streaming audio for every episode of the podcast series. And something that I was hoping we would have ready by today, but we're in the middle of working on, is we're gonna have a wing of our website that will be uh, filled with genealogical resource, resources, specifically so that uh, the descendants of the enslaved can 
try to find their enslaved ancestors. It's a really complicated process for African Americans to, to try to find their enslaved ancestors. And we wanna assist them. Um, and it's a major focus of this project going forward because during the course of the research I've done for this series, I have found all sorts of hidden um, resources that document by name in many cases, enslaved people from Kentucky during the antebellum period. And there are all sorts of ways of taking that data and making certain deductions from it that can help you connect to present day African Americans who descend from these people. Um, and I will say also that you can use these same resources if you are a white Kentuckian and you want to find out whether your ancestors were themselves enslavers. So uh, it, it, it'll be useful for both sides of the fence. Okay. So I wanna give you an idea of where we're heading with this project. We've got some pretty adventurous goals for this project. So in terms of the podcast, I am working right now on a mini series. It's gonna be at least three episodes. It might be as many as five or six on something loosely known as the Northwest Conspiracy. And if this were a, an actual crowd where I could see everybody, I would ask you to raise your hand if you'd ever heard of the Northwest Conspiracy. I hadn't, and I'm a complete American history, you know, nut. And I'd never heard of this, but in brief, it was a conspiracy among a whole lot of people, hundreds of thousands of people in what was known as the Northwest of the United States, which was uh, largely like Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, uh, Ohio, Iowa, and Missouri and Kentucky are sort of honorary parts of this because those were two border states that sided with the union. But as you may know, there were an awful lot of people in Kentucky who were actually Confederate um, sympathizers. And um, so it's quite a story. It, it, the, the, the big players in this story are all from Kentucky, both on the union side and the Confederate side. And they include um, uh, John Castleman of the Castleman statue uh, infamy, uh, who was a Confederate spy, who was part of the, this you know, basically interfaced with the Northerners who were collectively trying to overthrow the governments of Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, and install a pro-Confederate uh, state government in each of those states. And then uh, simultaneously um, basically assassinate all of the pro-Republican uh, or the Republican governors and the president and as many of, and the vice president, as many of the cabinet members that could be gotten to and install a pro-Confederate national government, federal government. It's quite a story and Kentucky's right smack dab in the middle of the story. So we're working on that. And it is a really interesting way to sort of move from a focus of the South only to the North because these are predominantly Northern states that are involved. Even New York City gets involved with this. The former mayor of New York City, just like we have today, uh, was one of the main conspirators of this. So um, it's of course very timely given everything that we are seeing uh, in the news in, in the recent past. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do a, a, a long series, uh, perhaps a year long, focusing on the impact of slavery in the North. And then the third phase of our project is to look, about how, look at how slavery influenced the development of the American West. Um, and it's intrinsic to the story of the American West. Really the whole reason behind West, westward development, a lot of it had to do with, you know, we wanted to have more and more and more places to have cotton fields and we needed more and more slaves to, to work cotton fields. So, um, yeah. And so uh, I'm, I'm running out of time here. So I wanna leave plenty of time for, um, for your questions. But I, I just wanted to say that, that going forward, and especially if there's anybody on this call that is in a position to help us with any of this, I wanna let you know that we are very interested in doing two things. Number one, we wanna really build out the information that we have on our website to become sort of this clearinghouse for all the available uh, information, primary documents pertaining to slavery in Kentucky. So, um, We'd love to be able to work with the Filson, the, the Kentucky Historical Society, UK, U of L, uh, all the different entities that have various archives and 
figure out a way to, to merge these in some sort of way uh, to, so that in particular, African-Americans can get at all of this stuff in, in a one kind of one-stop shop way. Um, and and uh, I've, I've had some conversations with these various institutions about this idea. It's a huge idea. It's not a simple one. It'll take money and time to do it. The other thing that I wanna do um, is to create a definitive database of every known incident of racial violence in Kentucky's history. Um, there is a, a discrepancy between what's at the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, the so-called lynching memorial down in Montgomery, Alabama, and the number of incidents of racial violence that George C. Wright has documented in his book, Racial Violence in Kentucky, which if there's one book I would recommend uh, for you to look at that would really change your way of thinking about what happened in Kentucky, it would be that book. Um, it, it was a primary source for a lot of the research that we did in our third episode of the, of the radio series. And um, so he has documented over 300 incidents of racial violence. And really all this stuff is, most of it is hiding in plain sight. There are newspaper articles, there are contemporary legal documents pertaining to a lot of these lynchings and mob violence events. And they should all be in one place and it should all be well documented, I believe. And it's, it, it's, it's doable. Um, and finally, we're gonna work on a book that'll take all this research that uh, I've been doing and my colleagues have been doing and hopefully make it something that would be suitable as a secondary textbook for Kentucky schools. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I wanna leave plenty of time for questions. And so I'm gonna turn things over to Hannah uh, to facilitate that part of the presentation. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, I am just blown away by the depth of your research. I learned so much. Um, and judging from the questions that are coming in, um, we have, are in for a great 30 minutes of conversation. So everyone, just a quick reminder, if you have not already um, left a question in the chat, um, we will take those now. Um, you mentioned a book about racial justice that you recommended. Could you restate the title of that book, a softball? Racial justice or racial violence? Maybe it was racial okay. violence. There's a All very right. different So topics. by the way, the quick thing I can do is send you to our website. Um, I'm going to, if I, if I could, just for a quick second, I should have done this before. Sure. I'm just going to. Uh, I have the link available. I can pop it in the chat right now. Uh, like. Well, sure. But I'll just, it, the picture uh, speaks a thousand words. We have a really sure. detailed bibliography on our website. Okay. And uh all of the, any books that we used to research this, including the one that the, the questioner asked, is, whoa, is uh, listed in here. The ones I was in particular talking about is George C. Wright's uh, books. He has written three different books that are on our list. Uh, no, I'm sorry, they're on the Kentucky version of the list. Anyway, he's written three books that I highly recommend. Uh, one is Violence in Kentucky, Racial Violence in Kentucky. Uh, then he has written a book uh, just about uh, Louisville's experience. Here they are, George C. Wright, uh, History of Blacks in Kentucky, Life Behind a Veil, which is the history of um, African-Americans in Louisville after the Civil War and racial violence in Kentucky. Those are Okay, so the important. answer is Racial Violence in Kentucky, published in 1996 by George C. Wright. Yes, and, all um, the, and, and there's links to all of these that'll take you to you know, Amazon or, and you can get them from the library, you can get them all sorts of places. Although by the way, if anybody is here on the phone from the library, uh, for some reason that book is not, it, somebody stole the book and never brought it back and they never bought another copy to my knowledge. The last time I checked, there are zero copies in there. Okay, note to our friends at the library. I do not know if we have anyone from the library with us, um, but we will. I, I've told them this. I've, I've messaged okay. them there, but nonetheless. Yeah. Okay, I, um, I'm just going to start questions in the or from most recent to uh, farther away. So if you asked a question at the beginning of the program, it will be at the end of our question. I'm just going to scroll up that way. Um, one of the more powerful components of the podcast series is the intersection between the history you reveal and the present day descendants of enslaved Kentuckians. Are there any particular aspects that surprised you or stood out to you about the ongoing impact of slavery on present day individuals or families that you met? That question is from Maureen at the Post. So I haven't really 
uh, I haven't done as much exploring of this as I wanted to. Um, once we found, we, I basically was interested in finding um, as many uh, descendants of enslaved people, specifically from Oxmoor, because we had, I was focusing on the, the Bullet family. And I was only able to really follow one family successfully to the present day. And that's the descendants of these two particular enslaved people who were married at Oxmoor and stayed together the rest of their lives. And um, what was most interesting to me and most rewarding to me is that these people, when I found them, it was uh, uh, the two distant cousins, and both of them are featured in this series, uh, Bridget Johnson and her, her cousin, Russ Bolds. And um, uh, first of all, they'd never met each other. Second of all, both of them had had the same experience. They had been using Ancestry.com uh, to try to research their family tree. And both of them had hit the same snag. And that's that they hit th this mark in the 1870 census. That's the first census where African-Americans are listed by first and last name, because uh, unless they were, I, I take that back. There were a handful, of course, of, of free people of color in the previous decades, if they were free people. But in terms of enslaved people, uh, that's the first time you can find them. And so they had hit this brick wall and they'd been really trying hard, especially this fellow Russ Bolds, who was a, a really quite a gifted a genealogist. And so I was able, because I was going from the top down, if you will, I was going from these enslaved people that I found mentioned in the writings that the letters of the Billet family, and then trying to figure out who their children and grandchildren might be. And they're coming up from the present day. And so they were delighted, moved, uh, overjoyed to be able to actually, in particular, I was able to find a photograph of their second and third, they're, they're two different generations, but second slash third generation grandmother. And um, according to them, it was ex an extremely moving and powerful experience for them. So I don't know if I'm answering the question, but that's, I wanna do a lot more with that, by the way. One of the goals of this project, uh, a short-term goal is to go through, and I've been talking to the folks at the Filson about this, is to try to go out of our way to follow in particular all the enslaved people from, um, uh, as I'm sure you folks are doing at, at Locust Grove, all the people that we know were enslaved by name at Oxmoor and follow them as many of their descendants down to the present as possible. Maybe some grad students could help with that or volunteers. That is exactly what we are doing at Locust Grove. Um, we are working, we have several um, researchers who are working, uh, volunteer researchers who are working to take the names that we know and take those threads all the way through to the present day. We have identified one or two descendants, I believe. Um, so then we can work kind of, and so hopefully we can meet in the middle in the way that you described. Um, a quick note as well, um, you mentioned Bridget Donklin. Johnson, right, um, from Oxmoor. And um, we, Bridget participated in a conversation we had with um, Joe McGill of the Slave Drilling Project, Oxmoor Farms, Farmington Historic Plantation, Riverside, the Farns and Norman Landing, um, back in October um, on engaging descendant communities. And I'll pop a link to that conversation in the chat so you can catch up on that. That is how Dan is speaking with us today. He logged into that program and we saw his name and said, ooh, Dan should speak at Locust Grove. Um, and we'll also be continuing our collaborative conversations with the Slave Drilling Project in those three other mobile sites in April. So everyone stay tuned um, for that. Um, another question, um, has anyone, um, have you or anyone in your, um, on your team researched anyone of Zebulon Ward's descendants? Um, is that a name you're familiar with? Yes. Um, I've seen some research on my own that his children and grandchildren continue to live in Arkansas. Yes. And I wondered if any of them have commented about their family history as it was portrayed in the record. Okay, short answer is I have not reached out to them. I too have seen evidence of them living in, Ar in, in Little Rock or in Arkansas in general. Um, no, I did not. I, uh, the, the episode of our podcast that was devoted to Zebulon Ward, um, was primarily an interview with me and this author who wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book about uh, him. It's really predominantly about this woman, um, Henry, uh, uh, I'm forgetting her name, Henrietta Ward, oh gosh, 
this is terrible, I'm forgetting her name. Um, anyway, there, an enslaved woman that he sold into, a, a free woman he sold into slavery. I'm, I'm space, spacing her name out for, I think it's um, Henrietta Wood. Yes, anyway, uh, so no, I haven't reached out to them. Um, that would be fascinating. Um, I've had the experience now of, of reaching out to a descendant of, of somebody who behaved badly during this era, and that's this fellow Stephen Chenoweth. And it's a really hard thing to parachute into someone's life uh, who may not know about their ancestor. You know, this might not be the sort of thing that they talk about in the Ward family. And, um, or maybe they have since this book came out, I don't know. I'd be fascinated to know, but I haven't done that one. Okay. Um, and it was Wood, someone confirmed. Yes, Wood. Yeah. Um, is there any data on freed slaves who became slave owners? Um, and this question is from Janet. So, uh, yes, there's actually a paper that was, you know, I think it's in the Filson's uh, Quarterly, um, that was written by uh, Blaine Hudson on the subject of um, enslaved or, you know, free people of color in Kentucky who owned slaves. Um, there is a famous woman uh, in Jefferson County, uh, basically the founder of Newburgh. Um, she, she's known by a couple of different names, her, you know, but her first name is Tevis. I forget her last, she has a married name and I've sometimes seen her with an, a different name. And um, she owned several people. Uh, so a common thing that happened, as I understand it, this is not to say that there were not in, uh, free people of color who owned slaves outright, just like any other, anybody else, and put them to work in their fields, etc. But it was a common thing for people to purchase family members or extended family members because there really wasn't a good way to get people out of slavery. It was, in some cases, it was, you know, easier or more expedient to purchase someone for a period of time, and then after a period of time, uh, you know, legally free them. But in some cases, it was, um, depending upon the state, it was legally difficult to do that. Um, so, meaning a black person doing it for another black person. So, it, I, I don't know enough about the laws of Kentucky at that time to know how easy it was to do that. But um, I, I would refer people to this article written by Blaine Hudson on the subject. Um, and the Filson Historical Society has a fantastic um, page on of resources on racial inequality in the Louisville and Jefferson County and Kentucky areas. Um, and I just put a link to that in the chat. There is at least one article by Blaine Hudson linked on that page. Um, it probably contains some of the same information that Dan has referenced, but the Filson um, is also a great resource for anyone looking to do further research um, especially into Blaine Hudson's papers. But I do need to say one thing, because that is a question that has come up a lot, it's a very small number. It's a very small number. Okay. Uh, so it, it don't, it, sometimes people overblow it, sort of like almost as part of sort of an, apolo uh, an apologetic way of looking at slavery. Well, now black people own black people too, so it wasn't that bad or, you know, and, and, uh, and so I just want to make the point that especially in Kentucky, it was a, a, a tiny number respective to the overall number of, of, of enslavers. Okay, that's, that's a good note. Um, from John, what kind of access did the enslaved have to education, uh, reading, writing, and any sort of uh, skilled training like woodworking or sewing? Um, I don't believe I'm a scholar, enough of a scholar on this to give you a definitive answer, but I will tell you that in our series, we quote from um, a formerly enslaved man. Um, gosh, I'm bad with names. I, my, uh, he, he's the founder or co-founder of Simmons College. Um, and I, he was, he's a minister. It's on the tip of my brain. Anyway, he's in our, our second and third episode. He appears in both places. Um, and um, he had to be taught to read on the sly. It was not literally illegal to teach an enslaved person to read and write in Kentucky as it was in some of the deeper South states, but it was deeply proscribed socially. So even though somebody might not end up in jail for doing it, 
it was the sort of thing that might invoke the wrath of your neighbors or vigilantes. Um, and, uh, and it most certainly became a focal point for racial violence after the Civil War. So in other words, if people were educated and especially if they were trying to teach other formerly enslaved people, um, formally or informally, uh, the, you know, people that would, people would then become the, the target for racial violence and having their houses burnt down, having the schools burnt down. Uh, I will say that one of the ugliest parts of the post-Civil War part of Kentucky's history is how difficult it was for African-Americans to, uh, to educate themselves, to establish schools. Um, the, it was a, an uphill battle all over the state, in particular in Louisville. The first several times people tried to put up schools, they were burnt down um, and they would have to rebuild. They would try to hire a teacher and then they would um, uh, threaten the teacher. So it was just a real uphill battle. Anyway, I know we're running out of time and lots of questions. That's okay. Um, if we go over a little bit to keep hearing all of the wonderful information you're giving us, I think our audience will forget us. Okay. Um, we believe that um, as a follow up to that, um, if I'm not mistaken, it was never illegal in Kentucky for the enslaved to learn to read and right. write. Um, right. And also we know that at Locust Grove, at least um, some of the slaves were probably literate. Um, we do have a letter from a family member in Washington, DC, who has taken an enslaved man from Locust Grove um, and is writing home saying, this man who, whose name I want to say is Alfred, but I'm probably wrong, saying he has not heard from the other slaves who are literate and has, you know, he hasn't gotten any letters. And it's, he's expecting to get letters because we have um, some, it was David, excuse me, the enslaved man was David, who was expecting letters from other um, members of the enslaved community at Locust Grove. Um, Just one thing I would say, and that is that because I, I think it's an important part of this history, and that is if you, if you look at the Kentucky censuses, let's just look at Louisville, because I've looked sure. in depth at Louisville. If you look at the Louisville censuses all the way up to 1940, you will see that the vast majority of the African-Americans, especially over a certain age, so those who would have been the, the, the enslaved people and their, and their first generation children, the number of people, the percentage of people who are illiterate in, in 1940, can't read, can't write, is huge, okay? And keep in mind that outside of Central High School in, in, in Louisville, there was not one single high school in Kentucky where an African-American could get a high school education until um, Lexington opened up their uh, high school in 1923, I want to say. It was in the early 20s. So for that entire 50, roughly, year period, you could not get an education beyond grade school. Um, so the deck was stacked. And by the way, there's a, I've, I've, I've learned of a family, um, descendants of a family, who moved after the Civil War from Louisville or from Kentucky to Indianapolis precisely because they wanted their kids to be able to get a high school education and they couldn't otherwise get it. That's good. That's a good note to remember that there were lots of barriers to education even after slavery yes. was over. Um, and even, even in some cases today. Correct. Um, Liberia, the idea of Liberia was for older, could you, uh, the question is worded oddly, so let me try to tease it out. Um, can you elaborate on the idea of Liberia? Was it for um, those who were older or no longer valued for labor or lease, or was it, how, how was that? Okay, up? so the, the concept, so, and again, I'm not a specific scholar of um, the colonization movement, but based on my understanding of it, it goes back quite a ways to the late uh, seven, 1700s, but um, really takes hold in the early 19, uh, uh, 19th century. Um, and uh, in particular was pushed hard by, I wanna say uh, Monroe, President Monroe after he left office, I think he was the first president of the colonization society. And the second president was Henry Clay. And the idea was that people would be encouraged to, um, in one way, shape, or form, emancipate their slaves, send them to Liberia. And by the way, this was not for their benefit. 
really. It was for white society's benefit. The idea being, and this was talked about a lot in various letters and editorials and newspapers that I've read in Kentucky, that you didn't want in free people of color around because they would give enslaved people ideas. And the big fear was insurrection. And I can't underscore it enough how much people were writing about fear of enslaved people rising up in violent insurrection. And the thinking was, if you have free people around in your community, it will give enslaved people ideas. So as soon as they're freed, get rid of them, get them out of the country. And that was the big idea of the colonization movement. It was not oh, these people should never have been taken from Africa in the first place, so we're gonna repatriate them where they came from for their own good. That, 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 that rhetoric might've been there, but what was really driving it is let's get them out of the United States. And by the way, there was a weird, but not insubstantial um, wing of the, Amer of the American abolitionist movement that was really not so much pro people of African descent and they should get a better uh, shake in life, but we should be an all white country. This, this, we, we should be a pure European, you know, so it's very nativist. It, it, it ties into the whole know nothing movement and all that, the idea that let's just be all white native born people. Nobody else should be here. You know, enslaved people shouldn't be, people from Africa shouldn't be here. We shouldn't have Irish, we shouldn't have Germans. It should just be, us, us really good Northern European white people. That's the only people who should be here. So um, an awful lot of that seems to grow out of, again, this fear of insurrection. And, um, and by the way, I should say it was a failed movement. Uh, enormous numbers of people went over there and died, whether of malaria or any number of other kinds of tropical diseases that they, uh, or they couldn't make any kind of money or support themselves uh, in farming over there. Uh, it was generally a catastrophe uh, in terms of um, how successful it was and, and it really kind of peters out. But back to your next question. Um, the next question is, have you received, or excuse me, have you discovered any oral history or documentation that narrates the enslaved journey through the Cumberland Gap? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, Sorry. good to know. Um, let me, scrolled up too fast. Um, have you been working with uh, Rynette Jones at the University of Kentucky, Kentucky African American database? No, and I would love to know, to get a, get contact, you know, information for that person. No, I will I send, I, fun fact, I will send you the transcript of the chat so that you can have that. Um, mm -hmm. I will make sure you get the contact information for Rynette okay. Jones. Thank you. Um, so that we have that. Um, the other, uh, another question that we had was the role of Cassius Clay in Kentucky slavery. Sure. Um, if you have any information yes. about that. Yeah. So I didn't, I wish I'd had a half hour just to talk about the anti-slavery movement. So that will be part two of your lecture series. We'll schedule yes, that for right, a couple right. months. <laughs> but, but basically there's three guys who sort of, um, um, who, who uh, typify three different strains of this sort of anti-slavery um, idea. On the far left side, if you will, is John Fee, the founder of Berea College, who was a flat out complete abolitionist. He, uh, he was for African-American equality, co-education, uh, you know, uh, multiracial education, everything that Berea is known for. He was pushing that agenda way back in the, in the earlier in the 19th century. Then sort of in the middle, if you will, is Cassius Clay. So Cassius, this is Cassius Marsalis Clay, um, uh, a, a cousin, somewhat distant cousin of uh, Henry Clay, but they are cousins. And he is not a, he's an anti-slavery man, largely for political reasons. He's pushing the notion of sort of, um, I guess today we think of it almost like sort of a proto-populist agenda, you know, that, um, that non-slave holding white farmers and small business people and even laborers should be the backbone of America. They should be able to thrive economically and they were being held back by the institution of slavery. So he pushed a lot the economic uh, rationale for stamping out slavery. 
And he was not particularly a friend of black people or uh, a big fan. I mean, he was really, um, you know, uh, very much a white supremacist in terms of his personal beliefs, it seems from the written record, but he believed it was extremely damaging to our country and to this state in particular in terms of its economy. So if you wanna think of him as sort of like the middle ground between um, let's say a Henry Clay who has decided that slavery has kind of outlived its usefulness to the country and it's causing more problems than it is um, a good thing for our economy, et cetera. And then on the other side, you have John Fee uh, pushing, you know, full, full blown abolitionism. Cassius Marcellus Clay is sort of somewhere in the middle. Okay, thank you for that great summary. Um, and some of these questions that we had at the very beginning of the program were answered at the very end of your program. Okay. How can educators find out about this information? Um, are you having any plans to present on KET? Do you have plans for a book? Um, so some of those you've answered yeah. already, um, but in a more general sense, if you can speak, just reiterate what you've already told us. But in your opinion, how can we improve how students are taught about slavery today yeah. accurately and without bias? So it's a huge uphill battle. Um, I know enough about, I've never taught in schools as a day-to-day -day teacher, but I, I, I have worked with, with schools around the country uh, with this other project I did, the This I Believe project. So I know how hard it is for individual educators or even individual schools to change curricula, change textbooks. Nobody has enough money. That, no public schools have enough money. So for instance, the idea of, oh, let's get rid of all of our American history textbooks and order a whole school full of new ones that are uh, more up-to-date and accurate and less biased is a, is a, is a tall order for a school system. So a lot of places are sort of stuck with what they're stuck with. They're stuck with badly outdated textbooks. They're, they're stuck with curricula that are still kind of steeped in this sort of lost cause um, apologist um, way of looking at the 19th century and, and antebellum era and, and the Civil War. Um, and the best things the teachers can do is, and a lot of them do this already, is teach kind of against the book. In other words, they're forced to use the textbook, but maybe they ignore that chapter or they actively tell their students, hey, this is messed up. Um, here's, I'm gonna give you these articles and these websites to look at and these primary care, primary um, source documents to read to show you what really happened, okay? And compare and contrast that with this um, stilted, um, incorrect version that's in our textbook. And I've talked to educators throughout the state that are doing exactly that to this day. So um, I would say, don't be held back by uh, the textbook you're using or the curriculum that you are being asked to use. You can always augment it with other stuff. And that's the purpose of our website. The educator part of our website is just chock filled with good primary source documents and curricula built by really uh, uh, gifted curricular writers um, that will help you have a different way to teach this history. And hopefully with the resources that you've developed, we're able to use that in museums as well. Um, because we- By the way, a quick shout out to the- forward to that. A, a quick shout out to the people who built that. Uh, Kathy Swan from the University of Kentucky and uh, Carly Mutertes, who runs something called the Kentucky Council for the Social Studies, I think it's called. And both of them did a fantastic job on that. And we're, uh, we are excited to dig into these resources um, in a lot more depth as we're looking for more field trip resources, more interpretation res resources, especially as we're hoping to eventually have people back on site physically to do more things. But until then, virtual conversations are great. All right, I have two more questions. Are you, um, and if you do have a question, um, I'm gonna ask everyone to keep their microphones muted. Um, if you have a question, please type it in the chat or email me at marketing at locustgrove.org. Um, so if you have a question, I see that we've, we've had some hands raised. If you would um, actually just type your question in the chat, that would be most helpful. Um, we do want to uh, recognize all the great people who are um, sitting there at home asking questions. Um, so two more questions that I have on my list, unless more come in. 
Was Kentucky ever reconstructed as a border state? It had to state its, change its constitution. What else changed as a result of federal law? All right, so the answer is no, we were not reconstructed. Um, because we technically stated the union, Kentucky was in a very peculiar state at the end of the Civil War, uh, more peculiar than our neighbors on the border, more peculiar than Delaware, Maryland, even Missouri, in that we had more enslaved people than any of those states. We had more people who were still enslaved circa 1865 than any other uh, of, this, of the border states. So that meant that um, there was a tremendous amount of, uh, amount of friction. Um, quite a few people that we've documented in, in the series continued to be enslaved well into 1866, 67, even 1868. If you can imagine this, there were people who were keeping people enslaved and just would keep them ignorant that slavery had ended. Okay, it's sort of like you hear about these like Japanese soldiers who were still on some remote island in you know, 1949 or 1950. Nobody told them the war ended, so they were still like, you know, ready to go. Well, there were still people enslaving uh, African Americans in Kentucky, you know, after the 13th Amendment. By the way, fun fact, Kentucky did not uh, actually um, uh, vote to, um, uh, to, What's, what's the thing states do? Um, they uh, ratify, ratify the 13th Amendment until 1976. So we were one of uh, a handful of states that refused to acknowledge the 13th Amendment. Um, so what that meant was there were Union troops still in Kentucky after the Civil War. Uh, there was the, the uh, Freeman's Bureau established in Kentucky, which was very weird because it was only supposed to be established in the states of the former Confederacy. But because they saw, and actually we've got this, we have a quote in our third episode from the guy who was running the Freeman's Bureau, um, who was General uh, uh, Howard, uh, that Howard University is named after, saying basically Kentucky is worse than any of the, the Deep South states. There's more violence happening here. It's a more, it's a worse place for black people than any other of the other places I have found is what he says in his correspondence. Um, so there were uh, union troops and um, officials from the Freedmen's Bureau until at least 1868, I believe in Kentucky. So it looked sort of reconstruction-y on the ground, but it was not legally reconstruction. So for instance, democratic um, state legislatures immediately took over the state legislature in 1866 um, and immediately voted in a series of black codes that were sort of proto Jim Crow laws in 1860, beginning of 1866 during that, that state legislature session um, and served as kind of, there's a, a fascinating paper that's been published that's in our bibliography called Rehearsal for Redemption, Rehearsal for Redemption. And it's specifically looking at how Kentucky paved the way for the Deep South and basically the, the, the Jim Crow laws that came into being in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s in the Deeper South. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, I'm always, as a native Kentuckian, it always surprises me how little I know about Kentucky's history until we have conversations like this. One of the things that blew me away, um, it's in the very first, episode of your podcast. It's in it's one of the very first things you said, only five individuals owned more than 100 slaves in Kentucky. And I just, my concept of Kentucky as I know it has expanded so much from today's conversation and from the episodes of your podcast. Um, and so I have a final question. Sure. If any questions come in um, after this, we will see if we have time to answer them. If not, you can always email the questions to me, marketing at locustgrove.org. My name is Hannah, and I will make sure that Dan gets your questions. And yeah, I was going to say, and I mean, I'm, I'm more than willing to give out my email address. If okay, people... well, we will. I, we, we sent, we'll be sending out a follow-up email here in the next couple of hours. So we will put Dan's uh, contact information in that email so that you can get any questions you have um, answered or any questions I missed. I apologize if I missed a question. We had a very lively chat today, um, which is great to see, but it's hard to collate all the questions. All right, uh, this question is from Ainsley. How would you recommend taking the learnings from the reckoning to reflect on the history of Kentucky 
how it has shaped institutions within Kentucky and how we move forward with that knowledge, both in terms of policy and educating our children and the general, general population. Well, that's quite a question. Um, so if, if I were, if I ruled the world, if I were the, like, um, the Kentucky czar, I would mandate that we like shut down all the whole state for like a week and everybody gets together and just like um, inhales the correct history of Kentucky collectively. You know, we meet in like Rupp Arena and Freedom Hall and all these different places and, and just, uh, you know, unlearn the, the inaccurate stuff and, and, and learn the, the accurate stuff so that, so that, we can have an educated electorate that can better understand the issues that are coming up in referenda, in political elections, in court cases, in, um, you know, at the local level, uh, allocating money from your, you know, whether here it's the Metro Council or in other parts of the state, you know, the, the county commissioners or whomever is making decisions about how to um, spend money to if you, I'll just speak for myself, in better understanding this history, it has completely changed the way I think about how we are doing business as a country right now. Okay, so this is even before the events of 2020 and all of the things that happened with the BLM protests after George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Arbery were killed, um, that there just seems to need to be a, a massive public education effort. And I would, Take, if I were gonna, again, rule the world, I would also um, do some sort of symposium for all of our state legislators and give them a crash course on what their colleagues were doing 100 years ago, 150 years ago, to understand where they fit into a continuum of elected officials in Kentucky that have been uh, maintaining a, a straight line from the end of the Civil War to today of the following. So this is one thing, if you, if another part of the legacy of slavery in Kentucky is that um, we have a terrible educational system in Kentucky. And one of the reasons we have a bad educational system is because uh, of the Republican Democratic political disagreements right after the Civil War. And um, we lost 20% of our tax funding in one felt swoop. This happened all over the South, by the way. And so all of a sudden they had to come up with new ways of paying for state services. And one of the quickest things they cut was education. So we never regained that. We ne it never became a politically popular thing to say, let's support the schools in Kentucky. And this goes, you can start to see this right away in 1866. Uh, pr prior to that, we had had a really progressive educational system, public educational system in Kentucky. Never again did we have a really progressive public education system. So. If you understand this history, you can understand better the, some of the political legacies that have carried on all the way through the past 150 years that are still bedeviling us today. Well, Dan, uh, I like your vision for the future where we're all more educated and informed about the past so that we can be more active and um, act more justly in the present and the future. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's okay, been wonderful to have me. you with us. Um, we'd also finally like to thank our sponsors, um, PNC Bank and John and Jamie Vizo for sponsoring the Living Room Lecture Series. Um, and please stay tuned to our email, to your email and our website for upcoming lecture series um, programs and other virtual programs from Locust Grove. We are closed uh, through the month of February. Um, we are making our plans for what reopening will look like um, for this spring. So please stay tuned with us. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Thank you, Dan. Um, and we will leave you. Um, we will leave you with a reminder to go visit the reckoning online um, and listen and stay tuned for more from Dan and the reckoning. All right. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. All right. Take care. Bye.